Welcome back, everyone. So today we will start our unit on emotions and stress. Um, the first lecture is on emotion. We'll talk about what they are, theories of emotions, where do they come from, how do we perceive them, what are they for, and how do we manage them adaptively? Because they are motivations and they're resources that you can use. So, what is emotion? Anyone know what that means? Don't know what emotions are? So what's what's an emotion? What happens when you when you experience one? You've you've had them before. Just want an example, like anger. Well, so there, anger is an emotion, but we don't know how to describe it. We don't know what it is. We don't have it. How do you go about describing it? Someone that does not know what one is. I'm going to untether myself and it survives for a moment. Uh, so what I heard you say is that there's there's examples of emotions, but you might not know what emotion is outside of that. I saw a hand. I think you're first. Um, emotions like a universal experience in relation to an event that has gone on. So there's physical and emotional traits of the emotions, and they're mostly the same across the world. Yes, so there's there's a, a universal nature to to emotions. And what was the other part of what she said? Blanking, yes. Go ahead. I'm just trying to remember what I had in my head. Sorry? I'm trying to remember what I had in my head. Ah, okay. Like the way we feel in response to events happening in our life. So it's a response. And what does that response include? What's what's happening in your body? What's happening in, in your mind? What are the components of an emotion? Like differing levels of, I guess, like, would heart rate be one of those? So yeah, heart rate could be part of it if you're excited. Heart rate and blood pressure scared, and so like could physical. Be, could be physical. Responses. Yeah, so that that's one, one side of, that's one component of emotion. And what else? Say so you're the, for the example of anger. So you're you're angry. Is it just physical? There's also the mental response and differing mental responses. Like anger, you mentally are a certain way. And what kind of or what might you be describe that a little bit more? Um, more likely to like pick a fight, more likely yeah, to so behavior. So you've got behavior. The so we've got the physio there's something happening physiologically and maybe your heart rate has increased there's could be a behavior like you got to punch someone in the nose i could observe that and then the last part last component um when you're angry some people body temperature goes up like you can get yeah, that body temperature could go up. That's that's also like like heart rate. That that goes along with with heart rate. So there's there's a third component. We've got the the body parts. I'm not certain it's true, but I do remember seeing something about different parts of your brain light up depending on what emotions you're experiencing. Would that be physiological as well? Physiological. Anything that happens in your mind or in in your brain, sorry, anything you do is is going to have some kind of brain activation correlated with it. So there's still one one missing piece. Would it be like your hormone levels for that direct kind of emotion? Hormone in a sense, is, 
still physiological. I think like, well, I remember like my psychologist always told me like, you need to be aware of it. Like you, like maybe sometimes I might be angry, but I'm not like really aware of it because I want to avoid it. And maybe I just express sadness instead, but in reality, I'm angry or it might be the other way around. I might be angry. No, I might be sad and I'm just like so angry, but it's just like, I'm avoiding an emotion because I'm not like really thinking about it. It is possible to be unconscious of your uh -huh, unconscious possible for emotional responses to uh, bypass the higher level conscious trap. So we're, we're kind of getting there. But the third component is cognition. And we don't have to be conscious of our emotions, but uh, we, we often are. And so an angry person might also be having angry thoughts. Right? They might perceive that an important boundary has been crossed, but there's been some justice, there's some injustice, and, and now they want redress. So an emotion is a response of the whole organism. It involves physiological arousal, like you were talking about, heart rate, maybe your body gets hotter, okay. expressive behavior, like you go punch someone, hopefully not, yell at them, I don't know, tell them off, search yourself. And then there often is some conscious experience arousing that, that comes from your, your interpretation of how you're feeling and from what's going on in your environment. So you're, you're aware of something consciously and there's some thought involved as well, right? So sad people maybe have sad thoughts and happy people might have happy thoughts. So emotions are instinctive states. I pulled up the, the general dictionary definition of emotion there. An instinctive or intuitive feeling as distinguished from reasoning or knowledge is something primal about emotions. Right? They are motivations. A natural instinctive state of mind deriving from one's circumstances, mood, relationships with others, whatever, but it's instinctive and primal. Okay? So they, emotions uh, come from the older and more primal part of your brain, your limbic system in, in your midbrain. So animals that uh, aren't very complicated cognitively, well, I suppose they are complicated, but those that are much simpler than, than we are and that may not have thoughts still have emotional reactions. Positive, you've heard of negative and, and positive emotions. And I want to define my, my terms here because people often use that to mean those words to mean pleasant or unpleasant. And that is not what I mean by them. A positive emotion makes you do something. It's a motivation to do something or to keep doing it if you're already doing it. I think last class we talked about how there's a Part of your forebrain called the, the basal ganglia that's involved with your intentional action. And if your intentional action, like pushing a lever, gets you something good, like a pellet of food, it rewards you with dopamine. We like dopamine, and that makes us keep doing it. So your positive emotions make you go do something or keep doing it if you're already doing it. And in this context, anger is a positive emotion. Where anger is a bit different, how when we were looking at personality, the negative emotions fall under neuroticism or emotionality. Um, on the hexaco, they pulled anger out of the emotionality factor, okay? and they put it on, on agreeableness, which might be a bit sort of dominance and, and submission. Anger is a key emotion in, in dominance. So anger is a positive emotion in the sense that it motivates you to go do something, okay? So it might not be pleasurable. And positive emotions are, are typically rewarding or pleasant, but just because something is pleasant doesn't make it good or desirable. So being on a cocaine high is pleasurable. We might not think that's good, and then negative emotions make you not do something or stop doing something. Mm -hmm. They're about threat detection, threat awareness. And they're typically punishing, like 
suffering, sadness, fear, shame, angst. And either positive emotion, both positive and negative emotions can be used adaptively or maladaptively. So just because you're, you're feeling pleasure doesn't mean you're doing something right or doing something good. And just because you are feeling a negative emotion doesn't necessarily mean that, that you're doing something wrong or that you shouldn't be having that feeling. If there's a legitimate danger out there and you feel anxious, well, good for you. You might make a better decision because of that. If you're running along the edge of a cliff and you feel anxiety, that's a good thing. But a lot of people think of emotions as um, positive is good and I should only have those and negative is bad and I should never have those. So we don't need to problematize negative emotions. They have adaptive value, but just like positive emotions, we need to um, act on them prudently. Uh, as you were saying, there's a, a universal quality to emotions. And we can even recognize them in other species. Like, you know, when your dog's happy or sad, you know, when your cat's angry. And so a, a spontaneous natural smile kind of means the same thing everywhere. And there are fake smiles that, that might be more culturally determined, but you know, this kind of means the same thing everywhere. What's that? I recognize it. Yes. Surprise. 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 Yeah, surprise. And then what's C? Fear. Yep, C is fear. What's D? Sadness. Yes, D is sadness. What's E? Anger. Yes, E is anger. Look for the pursing of the lips. And then uh, pouring his brow. And then what's what's F? Yes, F is disgust. See, I didn't have to tell you that. You just knew. Now I'm taking it on the authority of the textbook, as likely you are, uh, that uh, there is some method that establish the, the claim that there are ten basic. Ele basic elementary emotions, but I haven't reviewed those methods. So I don't know what the basis for that, that claim is. So your textbook tells you that Izzard's uh, 10 basic emotions. I did a quick search and I found that there were many different theories of emotions. Like there's one that's like, no, there's, there's four basic. And then there's another one that's like, there's, there's six, there's eight, there's 16, there's 32. So I don't know why they, they picked this one right, over all the other ones. I also notice uh, that they have contempt on the list of basic or elementary emotions, but I'm aware that other people who are studying anger consider contempt to be a blend of anger and disgust. Okay, so let's say that's a more complex emotion. Maybe it's a compound emotion. So there's an idea that there's primary emotions and we combine a couple of them to, to make a more complex emotion. So maybe, you know, what is pride, a combination of joy and what? Surprise? I don't know. Uh, it surprises me that, uh, that love wouldn't be seen as a basic emotion, right? Like that's part of limbic systems job involves caring for young. I also noticed uh, guilt and shame in there. What is, what's the difference between guilt and shame? Does anyone know that? Are the same emotion? And guilt can come after doing something and shame can come before as well. I mean, you can feel the shame if, you're, if you haven't done something. Because you can always feel shame, shame with yourself, and you can always feel... Unwilling. Yeah, but, but the gu guilt is only after doing something. Guilt's that, not like you did something. And yeah, you and you feel that I shouldn't have done that. They're, they're both social um, emotions. So cats 
hopefully don't feel these, but your dog has a guilty look, right? It knows that you told it not to do that. Um, yeah, so guilt can be a bit more private, like you, you might feel guilty about doing something that um, no one else knows about, but once other people know, then, oh no, the flood of shame, they're both, they're both social feelings, because uh, they're about having done something wrong, and good and bad are social constructs. Now, let's say you have an emotion, you don't have to stop there. You could have an emotion about having the emotion. So when you're angry, you could also be ashamed that you're angry. Okay? You could be sad that you're sad. Why am I always so sad? This is terrible. And so you can imagine how this complexifies your emotional life. It's, it's hard to, to let go of primary emotions because they're so instinctive. And if you're angry, maybe maybe it's enough to be angry without also being ashamed that you're angry. Because now you have two problems. Okay? It might not even be necessary to construct your anger as a problem. You are angry, period. Okay? And it can be okay to be angry and okay to be sad. You can judge your performance based on that. What are you going to go do with that feeling since you're angry? But, but you can... Free yourself a bit by, well, you can free a lot of cognitive bandwidth by giving yourself permission to feel your instinctive primal emotions. So emotions evolved as adaptive responses that support survival. Your fear keeps you out of trouble. I see a red light on my microphone again, and I need to go put myself back in. There we go. Okay, so your fear keeps you out of trouble. Um, sadness reminds you to connect with others. There we go. And so you can say that your anger is, is a gift to yourself, from yourself, that tells you what you need. And so if you're angry and you assert yourself effectively, you might be better off from it. But if you're angry, and you do, you know, punch your friend in the nose, that might make it worse. I'm going to throw this at you from here because I'm, I'm now tethered. Um, could you go back to the last slide? Yes, I can go back to the last slide. Okay. Um, couple of questions. Yes. I've heard a lot that you know, anger is like a secondary emotion. So what would you say it about... It could be a secondary emotion, depending on whether you're angry about feeling. So there's a, an original primary feeling, like let's say some, there was some wrongdoing, and you were angry about that. But that's a primary emotion. But then let's say you're like, well, I really shouldn't feel so angry because I should be more tolerant with Nessa or I should be nicer. Uh, and, and then you feel... You know, shame if you be anger or shame about the anger. So that's the secondary emotion, the emotion of being angry. It's like the, the meta emotion. I have one more question, but yeah. I forgot. Okay. You can, you can continue. All right. I will continue and then I might come back to you. Okay. So your emotion is what it is. Think of response, and then we can wonder you know, what are you going to do because of that? And then is that the prudent thing? And it may or may not be. Okay. Here's a couple of early theories of emotion and how about how feelings and, and thoughts could be connected. And the James Lang theory. I thought that the arousal came first. So let's say that you see a, a stimulus that is a bit scary, like a uh, scary dog. Well, then that makes your heart beat. And then you notice that your heart's beating and you interpret it. Oh, I'm afraid. But there is a limitation there. How do you know what the correct cognition is? So let's say your heart is beating fast. 
Well, how do you know if you're excited or scared? I'd be excited to see you going. Or I'm scared of going. There's, there's something missing here. Canon Bard's theory said that the arousal and the emotion happen at the same time. So you see a dog, heart rate elevates, you're aroused, and then you also feel say, scared. So that the stimulus simultaneously triggers the physiological response and the subjective experience of the emotion. They, they run in parallel. But that suggests that, that arousal and, and cognition are independent. But in fact, they're not. And our, our thoughts and our cognition can influence our arousal. And your interpretation of, of that dog changes the way you feel about it. And yeah, that's my, my friend's dog. And then there, there are people who, who have paraplegia and they, they can't feel anything below the neck. And they actually don't experience emotion the same way after that setting. So that suggests they're 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 not independent, they're in fact dependent. So people who have paraplegia don't feel um emotions viscerally. They wouldn't feel it fear in the pit of their stomach. And they wouldn't feel you know, let's move over here. It gets cooler and more cerebral. So there is a connection between the uh, subjective cognitive parts and the need for us. Theories have to start somewhere. As Schachter Singer's true factor theory was a more modern update there, and they think that we combine our arousal with some kind of a, an interpretation, and that results in the overall emotion. And according to that theory, emotions have two ingredients. There's physical arousal, and there's some kind of cognitive appraisal. You're thinking about what this means. And so the arousal kind of fuels your emotion, and your cognition channels to do some meaning. There is a, an experiment um, by Schachter and Figure in 1952 about spillover effects. And that what happened in that experiment is they, they gave people shots, injections of adrenaline. And adrenaline makes you feel like a rest, like a stress point, to make your heart beat faster. And then they, there was a confederate in the room, a confederate means like a research assistant. And in some cases, the confederate acted euphoric. And in other cases, the confederate acted angry. Those are both aroused states. And the experimental subjects interpreted their agitation um, in the context of the other person's emotion. Okay. So they thought they were angry too, or they thought they were euphoric too. So in your own previous emotional experiences, or cues from the environment can kind of carry over and color your interpretations of your feelings, your interpretation of the event. But if you had a bad day at work, and, and now you've gone home to your partner, and it moves to good for nothing, and socks are on the floor again. So emotions from one situation, carry over to another situation, and other people can also handle emotions. Well, yeah, the emotion is more than just the arousal. You have the arousal and you're like, what would And you get that interpretation from a lot of different places, including, you know, from your own history, from social scripts, from what other people are saying. There's a, a famous study about misattribution of arousal by Stephen and Aaron. And what they did was they had a research assistant who was an attractive woman wait at the end of a bridge for men who were, I guess, tourists who were coming off the bridge. And they used either a suspension bridge 
Okay, it's like a kind of scary bridge or a sturdy bridge. And, uh, and then she asked the, the guy to she can have their number, get them to participate in a psychology experiment, believe like they count of the, the number of numbers they got. And they, she was more likely to guess, get the guy's number when they came off the suspension bridge. Because right there, there were rats. And they might interpret that she is attractive because of that arousal. So if we were to apply this theory to your life, if, if you're going out, you're going to take your crush on a date, and you want them to be attracted to you, aroused by you, where what might be good places to take them? Yes, yeah, it's mention bridges, but there's there's not that many or so many of them around. But maybe you like to go a game and try to get some paper clip. Roller coasters, yeah. Um, sorry, it's a horror movie. Horror movie. Yes. So something that increases someone's heart rate might cause them to infer that you are the one who went to see them and not the suspension bridge or the roller coaster. And what this suggests is that you, know, you might want to avoid foreign foreign dates, library dates. So we haven't talked about the brain yet, but we, we have talked about the fact that you have an unconscious mind. And I'm talking about the unconscious mind as if it was one thing. But really, it, it's more than one thing. There's many, many kind of much processes that are going on right now that you're not aware of. But let's say there's two major categories. There's your conscious awareness and then everything else is going on that you're not conscious of. And so when we process emotions, it goes, goes to both tracks. So some of that information is it's into your midbrain, which is responsible for your emotional primal responses. And then it also, it also goes to, to the higher level of the brain, right? the more complex the cortex, the cortex in, in your core, yeah, core brain. So you might have an instinctive response to do something, and then maybe you wait a second or two and you think about whether that's be the right thing to do. Uh, but those are instinctive responses that are based on gut feelings are by and large adaptive, but they can get a little sometimes. So there's there's a role for bottom up unconscious processing for the emotion and a and a little top down conscious something how we interpret emotion. Uh, now I'm trying to remember why I picked these pictures here. Um, in these pictures, there, there's been research on, on cats where they put electrodes into their um, brain limbic system. And there's a, a part of your limbic system called the amygdala. Actually, there's one on either side. There's two of them, so I should probably call them the amygdala. But the amygdala are responsible for fear response and the anger response. And just by activating that electrode, you get the cat to engage in a rage display. But it's actually not an appropriate response to a mouse. And the appropriate response would be to go and, go and attack it and, and eat it because it's food. And by they can do that by stimulating some other brain. These are even if they're, they're complex responses, right? Like, something like you know, the bird, there's a different type of that behavior that's managed in the midbrain, and those responses don't require our conscious awareness. And I, I remember one of you saying that you be angry and not know the truth, and that's fine. And just as you were also saying, I think there's different emotions reflect different brain activity. 
negative emotions, including depression, are associated with activity in the right frontal lobe. And then positive emotions, and I believe this also applies to anger, film, protein, yes, um, are associated with activity on the left frontal lobe. And, and researchers learn this by doing electroconvulsive therapy on when people with depression. They realize that when they um, apply it to a certain side, people might end up really exuberant, a or it could be people. There is some lab mutation right now. Um, negative emotions are more commonly experienced by people of the female sex. Um, and in childhood, boys and girls are pretty much the same for a negative emotionality. At puberty, that changes. And uh, people of the female sex experience higher levels of negative emotion. And then that sort of tapers off over time and level that I um, believe after that pause. So there's there's perhaps we can speculate that there's some adaptive value to females of childbearing age being having a higher threat, being more sensitive to threat, but ultimately what they get emotions are about. Your uh, Midbrain, an interesting part of the brain, uh, that is involved in emotional responses and survival behavior, right? All of those Fs. It is that it actually developed over the primitive old picture. And humans are very, very visual creatures. And so we forget how important smell is to other animals. But you know this if you've ever walked a dog. They're sniffing all the time. They sniff for food and they sniff to see what other dogs have been around and, and what the territory is. And they sniff each other. And they sniff you. And the first thing a dog wants to do is like sniff your pups so and your identity. So, smells that are very, very important to most other. And in fact, a, a tongue cat will smell a female and be two miles away. Or just wee bats. Um, so it's not surprising that smell is connected to instincts and emotions are primitive to cognition. So there, there is a, an association between smell and emotion. So there's smells can look at memories and, and emotions, but they're not the same for everyone because it depends on your experience. So like the smell of leather could be a, a good smell to you or a it might remind you of a bad memory depending on what has happened to you. And there is an, an indication for the value of aromatherapy if it's appropriately applied. So it, it's not something that like cures diseases. If you have diabetes, like sniffing cinnamon oil is going to cure you, but it does help people to, to connect to emotions and to get into different emotional states. We might use it to, to relax. There's some evidence for effectiveness in anxiety and depression, which are about mood. But I think uh, you know, complementary and alternative therapies have power if there's no understood in use really. But what about the, the stability of emotions? Well, you have a temperament, and maybe you're in the crappy age, or maybe you're the happy age. And emotionality is a personality trait. If you measured on your hex code, you had a middle of the road score, and you had a very low score, indicating like emotional stability, relative to other people. Or maybe you had a very high score, getting more ups and downs. There's a heritable component to that. If you're really high strong, Maybe you have a parent who is too. Uh, so you have a set point for, for your emotions, it's like a baseline. And somebody that uh, tends to have more negative emotions will you know, always find something to be upset about. 
And you can take a, a person who's sort of more baseline happy, put them in different situations, and they keep acting happy. So it might be more about your set point physiologically than, than the events per se. But circumstances certainly do have an effect. Like you know what there's things happen to you that make you feel happy or sad or angry. The the ups and downs that are caused by life events tend to balance out. So sometimes people think, uh, oh, you know, if only I could get this job, or if only I got married, then I would be what the research suggests is that when there's a big life event, people tend to go kind of back to baseline. So a lot of people think that if they were to win a lottery, like it's then they their problems should be solved. It's not really what happens. And about a year later, we'll go back to where they were before. Had a lot of problems, money, I have money, and then you have money problems. Yeah, new problems. You find new problems. Um, in epidemiology, we have what are called health, sorry, health related quality of life models. And these models assume that if you're healthy, then you're also happy. But if you lose health, then okay, you're no longer in an ambulatory, or you can't see, but then you'll experience low quality of life. And you do but uh, they're not that well validated because. Many people who are, you know, not people who are, are not ambulatory, people with disabilities are, are not as sad as they're expected to be by dogs. They'd be doing a lot better than that. We might imagine that, that it would be tragic to not be able to walk anymore. Well, the wheelchairs can get along very nicely because they can't. We got their charge there. Yes. Um, I was just like wondering when you said people who win the lottery, they tend to feel the same. Did you mean like they go back to the like, baseline yeah, like of not you, being happy? So they're super happy when they win it, but then they go back to baseline. Okay. Thank you. It doesn't uh doesn't keep them happy forever. Yes. Um how much of the heritability would you say is like nature versus nurture? So that's suggesting that the heritability is saying it's 36% um, nature. Okay. But then remember, there's all these like limitations to the heritability studies because we have to worry about, oh, what was the range of environments and tested? But they're, the best of what we have suggests there's a, a modest component of heritability of nature. Adaptation is a, a, an important principle in psychology. It's an important principle in like sensation and perception. If I were to turn on a fan, you would notice the sound. You might notice it a lot, but it might even piss you off. But after about like a minute, you wouldn't be noticing it anymore. And then it might be like it wasn't there at all. But if I drew your attention to it, then you might notice it again. Then you adapt again. And if you got used to it and I turned it off, you would notice that it was quiet. So our brains are wired to notice change and to adapt to stability. And that has a lot of different applications in, in psychology. And so, you know, if you have a low income, you might adapt to that. If you have a high income, you'd adapt to that. And so we, we often predict that it would be so awful if such a thing happened, but you'd probably adapt. Yes. Um, what about people who don't, like, something's like happening continuously and like they get mad, like what, what would that oh like something is is pissing you off and yeah it's really and then you to, you're consciously aware of it and you're focused on it so like what would it say about them like i don't know emotionally or it says they're focusing like your sensory systems are being bombarded with so much information all the time 
and we're only aware of a very small part of it. And that's that could that's often what we choose to be aware of. And then if there's a change, we're wired to detect the change and then go back to doing what we're doing while there's no threat. But if you focus on something, it can really bother you. Like if, if you'd like decide to listen to that, there's a weird hum there. You know, is it the light? I can focus on that and be annoyed by that. It actually sounds louder to me. It's a fan of the projector, okay. Um, all right, where, where are we? So we are wired to, to adapt to our circumstances. And so if something really good happens to you, you'll probably feel good for a while and then adapt to it. If something really bad happens to you, you'll you might feel shocked at first and then you'll adapt just again and go back to baseline. And we have our baselines in different places. Um, when something happens to us, we make the, an assessment that it's good or bad. And that's based on things like social scripts, what we're told are good and bad events, um, based on our prior experience. So let's say that somebody gets a, a B on a exam, they might be very happy with that if they're used to getting lower grades. And if they're used to getting high grades, they might be very, um, very upset by that. I had an, an email from a student who was like saying she was extremely upset about her midterm. It's like 72. Anything over 60 is satisfactory in my mind. So context matters. Okay? When something happens, you evaluate that in, in a broader context. Facial feedback research is, is interesting. So if you feel happy, feel joy, will smile spontaneously. And there's, there's a connection there such that the fact that you're smiling or telling your brain that you're happy. Happy, and smile, now these things are paired. And so if you take a, bent, a pencil and bite it, you will feel happier because your brain is receiving the message those muscles are activated. And those are the muscles that, that are activated when, when you smile. Um, Botox is possibly as effective as antidepressants. What does is, what is Botox do? It can do a lot of things, but most people use it to um, stop from frowning, get at least frown lines. So if you have a peaceful brow, you're not gonna, right? you're not having frowny thoughts because you can't frown. So there is evidence that Botox is effective for treating anxiety. I don't know how long-term those results are, but I, know, I think the, the injections last about three months. And so that, that's behavior feedback. So the way we're acting influences how we feel and how other people feel about us and respond to us. So you can be upset and angry and still behave in a way that's polite and cordial. You decide to act that way. And you might find yourself feeling less angry because of that feedback effect. And people will also perceive you differently and they might be uh, more friendly to you. And then, right, you may feel less angry because of that. Um, understanding feedback effects can be used to increase empathic behavior. So if you let your face mimic another person's facial expression, it might help you understand their emotions better. Now, detecting emotions in others isn't as simple as seeing whether they're smiling or not. It's possible to fake smile. We smile for a lot of reasons. That are not that we're happy, like it's a polite thing to do. It's also an appeasement gesture, a sign of submission. People who are socially submissive smile more. It appeases the dominant. So how do you know if they're they're really happy or not? Well, the, the spontaneous smile is called the Duchenne smile. 
and uh, it engages a bunch of other muscles. Okay, so it's not just about the smile. It's also about the way um, muscles in the cheeks are working. And it's also about the eyes. Okay? It engages the eyes. So a smile with kind of dead eyes might, uh, might not be spontaneous or authentic smile. We read other people's emotions from their facial expressions, from their gestures. Actually, uh, reading facial expressions is another function of the brain that's localized in the big brain. It tells you how to move and how primal that is. And, and we also pick it up like vocal tones. And that is all missing in written communication, which is a uh, very modern development. In the, if you think of all of human history, it's very recent development. And so sometimes conflicts can get worse or spiral because it's hard to read how people are feeling out of just from what they write. And we can misinterpret them, what they're feeling. Um, women tend to be better at reading emotion, except anger, or better at that one. They tend to be more empathic. That means able to read other people's emotions that way. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, and they tend to express more emotions with their faces. There's an interesting study here. This is a uh, computer generated face that is androgynous. So you can't really say it's a male face or a female face. But um, when they make the face smile, people are more likely to think that's a female face. And when they make the face angry, then people are more likely to perceive it as a male face. We're also more likely to attribute female emotion to disposition, right, to personality, to temperament, and more likely to attribute male emotionality to circumstance. And like he's angry because of the traffic, right? Not obviously he's an angry person. So I'm gonna get into anger because you can see there's so there's an associate, there's some kind of connection here between anger and, and dominance. So let's, let's delve deeper in, into anger. So anger is an intense emotional state involving strong, uncomfortable, and non-cooperative response to a perceived provocation, hurt, or threat. It's your fight response. And what do we mean by non-cooperative? When you're angry, you're, you don't want to submit, do you, right? You want to fight back. You don't want to go along to get along. You want to put your foot down, say no, enough of this. We're not doing that. Okay, there's something about anger that's not about appeasement or about going along, which is what they're kind of getting at the idea of cooperative. It's your fight response. Anger does increase testosterone and it's interesting how we think about anger socially. It's constructed as uh, inappropriate for those of lower social status. So it's okay for the CEO to be angry, for the boss, that's, that's righteous anger. But for the, the subordinate, for the janitor to be angry, that could be a problem. Maybe that's not a respectful employee, okay? The textbook struck me as a bit confused about anger. Like it didn't seem, my sense of reading it was that like they, they, they're trying to determine whether anger is good or bad. It has all these like, you know, health effects, like it's not good for your heart. Uh, but maybe it's a good thing if you assert yourself and, and they seem to be trying to work that out. And it, it struck me that what they're missing is the lens of, of adaptivism. So anger is a resource, it's a motivation that may or may not be used adaptively. And what you can do with your anger depends on your social context. And I think they're critically missing a power lens. Okay? Anger is a key, it's the key emotion associated with, with dominance. So according to Solomon's cognitivist theory of emotions, anger, 
is something that is expressed between equals and involves that sense of discomfort, of arousal, and the sense that there's been some injustice or that there's a threat that we need to respond to. And, and then you take action to stop the harm or address the threat. You, you assert yourself. And that can be healthy, right? Because you, you set boundaries. Sometimes after you set a boundary, you have to enforce it. Otherwise, it's not a boundary anymore. Okay? And it can promote justice and redress grievances. Where we can, through being angry, actively redress grievances and, and make things a bit better. But what happens if, if there's a power difference, right? So according to this theory, if somebody has higher social status, they have more power, then they experience contempt toward the person with lower status. And you meet somebody who's experiencing contempt views the target of their contempt as, as unworthy. And they treat them with cool disregard. You know, like when you get brushed off and, and dismissed, feels like your experiences don't matter. Well, when your construct is unworthy, then you don't matter. And that you experience it through your feelings. And, and these feelings are associated with different attitudes. So the person who has, who feels contempt, believes that the target should sort of remove themselves, right? Like, like be gone, okay? They don't want to confront or deal directly with the target. They'd rather have someone else do it. They might talk to someone else about their feelings and have that other person go and manage you. And so you get social bullying in that kind of situation because they're not, they don't want to deal with you directly. And they can um, act in ways that, that are exclusive socially, so they exclude the target, okay? And, and they'd rather have someone else get rid of that person, right? Like, like have the maid get rid of the spider. And what's the opposite of that? Well, it would be resentment. And that's felt by the lower power, lower status person towards the higher status person. And it comes with, with bitterness. Because it's mixed with fear, a disappointment. And if you have less power, and power is the ability to do things, well, what can you do about your anger? Especially if you might be retaliated against for it. And so people can spiral into feelings of like hopelessness and they can become apathetic maybe the only thing they can do is is let go because they can't do anything else so if you ever get into studying conflict resolution let's say in io psychology um they always construct conflicts as between equals and, and between pairs they seem to forget that there's a, a social context and that you know, people come in cliques and groups and that some people in groups are more powerful than others. And, and they construct it as you know, between equal status parties when in fact that's not usually not the case, I mean, especially in the workplace where you have really hierarchical social dynamics. So if you're angry, I mean, there's ways to experience that maladaptively. And, and sometimes that's the context that you're in. But chronic hostility is linked to heart disease. And, and chronic hostility sounds stressful, and physiological stress is part on your heart. Um, expressing anger can make you more angry. There's, there's a question about like catharsis. Like, if you're angry, does go, going to go smash plates make you feel better about it or not? Possibly not, because you're not actually doing anything about the real situation that's making you anger, angry. Um, expressions of frustration are associated with a perceived decrease in social status. Like you're like, like I can't cope, and you're like, ha ha. That frustration, and and in cases of of workplace bullying, people will be treated in ways that that are provocative, and they provoke the person into showing displays of frustration that further reduce their status. So if that ever happens to you, do not react to provocation, right? It's best to sort of stay calm and not react. But there are adaptive ways to leverage anger. You can, you can use it to communicate strength and, and confidence. And it, it can 
be, be part of resolving a conflict by addressing it. And so um, the best way to do that is, is assertively and sort of courageously and in a very controlled way, find an opportunity to sort of set and communicate boundaries. But if somebody has more power than you and they don't care about your boundaries, well, you know, it's hard to have that conversation. They might not give you the space to make that conversation and then maybe they'll retaliate against you for having that conversation. But you see how the power lens is in this. Just, I pulled that out of the textbook. And if you really can't do anything about it, then it may be best to let go. All right, that was anger. I'm going to flip to, to happiness. And that's interesting because the textbook talks about happiness, but they don't give you a definition. So what is what is happiness? What does that word mean? Not sad. Not sad. So okay, good one. Um, you're defining it as the absence of negative emotion. Or a psychologist, people will come to you because they want to be happy. So you need to know what it is. Satisfaction. See, that's different. Those aren't the same thing. Satisfaction. Like if you have a drive, like you're thirsty, and then you fill the drive and you feel satisfied. Being satisfied says, like, oh, this is okay. We're, we're good where we are now. When things are under control, ish. When things are under control, kind of like the sense that like like all is is well. Well is an interesting word. It means good. There's a whole moral philosophy behind what good is. So happiness could be the absence of negative emotion, be a feeling of satisfaction. Maybe you're satisfied that everything is going well. What else could it mean to be happy? What basic emotion is it associated with? Joy. Joy. Yeah, so you could feel joy. So that's like feeling positive emotion. I suppose there's more positive emotions than, than just joy. Feeling love. Could be feeling belonging. So it's not defined in the textbook that they talk about it. And so it's not clear what they're talking about or what the studies are that they're citing or measuring. Okay, is it joy, the basic emotion? Is it life satisfaction, subjective well being? Is it domain specific or is it general? Is it optimism? They talk about optimism too. That's like an outlook. Okay, is it measured in the moment or are you assessing your life generally and and this is an issue in psychology there's there's no clear definition i went and found it i went and googled this you know what's the definition of happiness in psychology well there isn't one okay historically the term refers to good luck it means lucky and what do i mean by historically those those authors went and looked at the, the use of the word happy in, in text going back hundreds of years. And so traditionally it refers to fortunate happenstance. Okay, so 
you found food today. That a happy accident. You know, you ran into your friend. And we all want and, and like good luck. So, so historically, it means luck. It refers to, to good fortune. Funny how the word has, has changed over time. Because sometimes people act like there's a, a mythical island of happiness that they're trying to get to. And if you do the right things, get the right job, get the right decisions, then maybe you will get to the mythical island of happiness where you can live forever. There's adaptive value to, to positive emotions. Like when we're feeling positive emotions, we're more likely to, to help other people. A lot of people believe that money will make them happy. And in psychology, you always want to ask, who are these people? And oh, it's American college students. 85% of the research in psychology is done on Western university students. So if that's not your demographic and these are like mostly like white class privileged people, then maybe that doesn't resonate with you. But there is a belief that, that you know, money will make you happy. And you know, money is a resource and it makes more of a difference when you have less of it. That same principle applies to just even perceiving changes in light in a room. If you're in a really dark room, the light of one candle is like a lot of light. But if you're in a bright room and you added that light of one candle, it makes like no difference. So a thousand dollars would mean a lot to somebody who was chronically underemployed, but it would mean like nothing to Bill Gates. So the correlation between money and happiness is one that tends that isn't eternally linear, it, it flattens out. And there is a value at which most people don't experience more happiness with more income. Because more income comes with with problems, like you spend more time at work and you're stressed about your workplace and et cetera, et cetera. You're spending less time with, say, your family or on your hobbies. So there's a point at which it, it flattens out. And um, I can't, I don't remember what that value is in, in 2023 dollars. I know that it's seven, I think it was 70,000 about like, you know, for that probably maybe 10 years ago. So I wouldn't know how to adjust for inflation in my head. Um, but the, the point is that increasing wealth matters less once your basic needs are met. We live in a very affluent country. Okay, we have like lots of stuff. Most of us have so much stuff that we are struggling with the burden of ownership. We have all kinds of clutter. Okay? And so further economic growth in affluent countries does not do anything to increase the wealth of gain of citizens because they, they have enough stuff and they have enough to eat. And now it's about other things, maybe about relationships. Sense of satisfaction with what we have comes from comparison. Some of the happiest, when they, when they do this happiness research, however they do it, I think Gallup does it, um, sometimes they find that the happiest people live in um, places where there's more equality. And if everyone is poor together, you might have more happy people than if there are big disparities in income. So your sense of, of, of deprivation is relative. It's relative to your perception that you're worse off compared to people around you, whoever you're comparing yourself to. And, and you can always compare yourself to the next level up and feel bad. So you can play that game for only. So we contextualized anger in terms of power and inequality, and, and we can do that with happiness too. Social context matters. This is a, um, a table from your textbook that I thought was, was interesting. Uh, so they say that uh, it doesn't seem related to, to age, not to gender on average. So women tend to have more emotional ups and downs, average out to the same place, so like same mean, larger variance or standard deviation. And that, and it doesn't seem to, uh, 
to be related to physical attractiveness. But a lot of people think that if they were more attractive, then they would be happier. A lot of people think that if they were earning more money, then they would be happier. Um, summarizing research on happiness, I'd say the three most important things are like relationships, relationships, and relationships. I can't quite remember what the exact measures of relationships were. Um, I think in one case, it was like the number of like close friends you have. And another one might have been like, you know, do you have like a, a long term relationship? But they were all like relationship things. Okay. Um, so close, positive, lasting relationships. Um, having work and, and leisure that engages your skills. In religious cultures, people who have who are religious tend to be happier. Um, I thought the one about self-esteem was interesting in individualistic cultures. That says a lot about culture. Um, we do know that that pursuing self-esteem, that conditional self-esteem is not a good thing. But if you have secure self-worth, then say that's a, a fountain of happiness. Um, and it's important to, to sleep well. The strongest predictor of depression is uh, sleep deprivation. Okay, so sleep well, eat healthy. So, you, so your neurotransmitters are all working the way they should. And, and then exercise. Because exercise produces endorphins, which make you feel, feel good. And feeling good, um, having these sort of positive emotions or feelings is one of the ways that we define happiness. So if you want to be happier, I mean, the number one thing is to prioritize your close relationships. We adapt to everything around us, including the good things that we have. Okay, so being happy is about being fortunate, being lucky. There's all kinds of ways that you experience good fortune on a regular basis. No, we're in this, this room and there's no missiles landing in it. And so that's, that's gratitude. Gratitude is about noticing those good things that you have because what most human brains do if they're working properly is forget about it and then go focus on the problems. And you're wired to, to notice what's missing and to notice things that could be threats and dangers and to stop noticing the things around you that, that are stable. But you could bring your attention back to the good things around you that you have. Right back to your good fortune. And so it's, um, I've gotten a lot out of practice of gratitude where just like every day write down what I'm grateful for. And uh, I did that for about two years. And one of the biggest things that jumped out at me was that it's, uh, it wasn't really accomplishments. Right? It was more about people. And so if you're gonna spend money, sometimes doing something with a friend would make you happier than um, buying another thing. Because remember, you might feel happy once you buy the thing, but then you're going to get used to it and it won't make you happy anymore. But uh, I don't know, friends are, are full of fun. So it's ironic, really, that people spend a lot of time stressing themselves out, right? doing things like pursuing like money and status and, and accolades that they think will make them happy, but they don't. And often what they're kind of aware of is that there's a hole and a sense of yearning. They keep going. They keep trying to accomplish more and earn more money and buy more things. And in doing that, we sacrifice the things that really do make us happy. Okay? It's, it's your friends, your family, the people in your life, your relationships. Those are number one. It's like your health. Okay? And so we sacrifice those things the things that make us happy in order to do these other things that, that we think is going to make us happy or will make us happy. Maybe we're taught that, that that's the good life. And it's ironic that we compromise the things that actually make us happy in order to do that. And so the rat race is the idea that there's an endless, exhausting self-defeating competitive struggle to to get ahead that leaves no time 
for, for relaxation or for enjoyment. Um, people who, who do that all their lives can find themselves very, very lonely after retirement. Okay. And so these two people are the ministers of loneliness. The United Kingdom has a minister of loneliness. That is a big social issue. And so does Japan. It's another industrialized nation where people can work really, really hard to be productive. And if you do that your whole life, you know, there was the friends that you made in, when you were an undergraduate, but, you know, you go your way and they go their way. And over time, you kind of you fall out of touch. And if you do that for 20, 30 years, you can get very involved in your workplace. Well, you know, when that suddenly, when that ends, like at retirement or sometimes with a layoff, people can um, find themselves without those relationships that they need because they haven't invested in them. So we can focus on our, on our material needs to the detriment of our emotional needs. And for most of us, like in industrial nations, our material needs have already been met. Like you, you have enough shoes, right? You have enough clothes. But do you spend enough time with your family? And do you spend enough time with your friends? So that brings me to well-being, which is a bigger concept than happiness. But well means good. So there are there are different theories of well-being, and the most common are, are hedonic, eudaimonic, and utilitarian. You'll remember Hedon, Hedony, the daughter of Psyche and Eros, the goddess of pleasure and delight. And a hedonic moral philosophy is the idea that well-being is having positive feelings and not having negative feelings. And that's kind of the, the most common lay moral philosophy. And, and you'll hear it even, I encounter it in, in a lot of psychological research. Okay? The, the presence of positive emotions and the absence of, of negative emotions. And, and I'm a little, it's not one that's well regarded by moral philosophers. And it neglects the adaptive value of suffering. Your negative emotions are, are part of a healthy emotional life. And if you were to abolish them, I don't know that anything would, would be better. Then there's eudaimonic well-being, and that's your theory of well-being as constant striving for achievement, for self-actualization, to be everything that you can be. An issue with eudaimonic theories of well-being is that they're very self-focused. And my criticism of like Maslow's higher. A lot of things have to be serving you for you to, you know, fully and completely express yourself all your time, all the time. Then there's utilitarian moral philosophy, and that's where the utilitarian theories of well-being and modern moral philosophy has tended in a more utilitarian uh, direction. And that idea is that you have a rational capacity to know and do the right thing. Ultimately, well-being refers to what is good for you, to what is good. And you can't answer that question without getting deep into moral philosophy. And people have debated this stuff for thousands of years, and it's all these different religions. Well-being ultimately means good being. The World Health Organization's definition of mental health is, is a utilitarian one. They define it as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes their own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively, and is able to make a contribution to their community. There's nothing in there about pleasure or satisfaction. You can suffer and have well being. You can be sick and have well being. You can be ridden with negative emotion and still have well being. If you're aware of your abilities and your talents, you can generally cope and make a contribution. 
That's what well-being is, according to the World Health Organization. Okay. But let's say that you, you want to have more fun than that, which is perfectly rational. Well, joy is a basic emotion that you have a cap capacity for, right? And, and you can practice it. You can develop your capacity for joy. There are things in your life that make you feel joy. You can go do a bit more of that. Okay? You can look around at things in, in your life that, that are good and realize your, your good fortune. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, because it's 2.15, and I'll start with emotion utilization next class. Thank you very much for your attention. I will stop recording.